Hello everyone, welcome to episode 11 of Remaking Cave Story in C++. Uh, this episode is about slopes and a little bit of jumping. I am Limeotes, my website is limeotes.com, my Twitter is at Limeotes, my GitHub link is here, and my subreddit is here. So, what are we focusing on today? The title says slopes, and that is correct. We need to be able to run up and down slopes. Currently, we only have rectangular tile collisions. And so a slope, if we look at our tiled map, let me close out of this one, open up this one. So here's our tile map that we have. Slopes are all of these. Um, let me get a pointer. So Slopes are these. This is a slope. This, uh, coming up from the water, these are slopes. These are slopes too, technically. Um, the ceiling slopes. We're just going to make them rectangles though, just to collide and just fall back down. We could technically uh, make these slopes where if you hit them from the top, you'll hit in the right spot and then fall down, but um, I'm not trying to focus too heavily on physics um, for this. We're making the physics work, but I don't want to get too crazy with it. So uh, I want to get really everything else in this game and just have the physics working. So we're going to make the up and down slopes like these um, on the ground, but we're not going to focus on ceiling slopes. We're just going to make them rectangles. Um, Okay, so that's what we need to do. We need to make those work. And also, I guess I'll add this in, we need to be able to jump. I didn't have that in my notes. But we're going to do jumping too, just so we can watch everything work nicely. Um, a couple details. Polyline slopes. A polyline is a, uh, it's a part of tiled here. Remember how for our regular collisions we use this rectangle? A polyline is this, uh, this one over here, this insert polyline thing. Basically what a polyline is, is you click somewhere and you get this line that comes out of where your mouse foot is. And then if you click again, you can draw more and just draw as many as you want. Lines. So that's pretty good for what we want to do. Um, so we're going to use that to draw on our slopes. And then also our jump speed is 0 0.7. Um, yeah, it's just a number that felt pretty good to me uh, when I was trying it out. So that's what we'll make our jump speed for now. So what do we need to do to accomplish all of this? Well, first we need to create a new object layer and tile it's called slopes. Then we need to draw the slopes in with the polyline tool that I just showed you. Then we're going to create a utility class called utils uh, to hold a string split function. We're going to need that. I'll show you why uh, why we're going to need it, and then we'll implement that. Um, and I'll explain what it even is. Then we're going to create a slope class. Uh, just like we have a tile class, we're going to create our own slope class. Then we're going to create a list of slopes in the level class, just like we have all our list of tiles and everything. Then we're going to parse them, the slopes out of the TMX file. Then we're going to handle the slope collisions, doing stuff in the player class and the game class. And then finally we're just going to add jumping and then watch everything work. Okay. So let's actually start by drawing in the slopes and tiles. So first things first, we need to create a new object layer, make sure you're on objects, called slopes. Now with that selected, go ahead and click on the polyline tool and just start drawing in slopes. You get pretty close to make sure that they're accurate, like this, and just draw them in. Doesn't matter the angle, it doesn't have to be exactly like mine, you could even do this, it would technically work. But I just kind of make it line up with the, the tile so it looks right. That looks good. And then once you click and you're happy with your slope, just hit enter and it'll 
keep your slope in there, and then you can move on to the next one. Also, uh, it doesn't matter if you which part of the slope you start with. We write special logic to handle uh, that because technically there are two separate points: this point and the point that I clicked here to start. And if you the calculation is slightly different um, depending on which one you start with. So, but we handle that. So just draw it in, um, and then this one too. The collision can get a little weird if you if it isn't close enough to the rectangles. So just make sure you handle that. And we'll put a little one here. It's not really a big slope, but whatever. And you could technically put as many as you want. That's really as many as I see that are necessary. I could put one here too, I guess. Okay. Now, zoom back out. And let's draw in our ceiling uh, where the slopes are too. So go to collisions, that uh, layer, object layer. Go back to insert rectangle and just draw a really rough ceiling. Doesn't have to be exact, just close enough. Again, we're not trying to make this perfect, we're just trying to make it functional so we can move on to the other important parts of making a game. Uh, I'll put a little tiny one here, I guess. Yeah, that's good. Um, then one here. Good. Uh, one over here. That's good. One here. That's good. And I think that's it. I think that covers our whole level. You want to try to use as few as you can. You don't want to make tons of little tiny ones because that's a whole extra collision check we have to do in the code so it might slow down the code eventually but this is a small level I wanted to make it pretty tight so that should be good enough okay so go ahead and save that and that's good so now that we did those two things now we're going to create our utility class and a string split function so go into headers New file and do uh, sorry utils utils dot h. So again, this is going to be a bunch of helper utility functions to use throughout the code. Similar to our globals, how we use those everywhere. This is going to be another uh, globalish set of functions. So class utils, and we're going to have a public function, and it's going to be static so that we don't have to actually create an instance of utils every time we want to use it. We could just call it using the class name and then the function. So it's going to look like static unsigned int split, taking in a const std string text and an std vector of std strings uh, strs which stands for strings and a character so before I actually implement this let me make a comment explaining exactly what's going on here so int split I guess unsigned int split is better Split a string, which is our text variable. So the string is our text variable. Everywhere a certain character, which is our ch variable, is found. Store the resulting substrings in a vector, which is the strs vector we're passing in. So we're going to pass in a vector to hold all of our split substrings. And then the unsigned int that we're returning is um, the size of the vector. Vectors 
vector dot size returns an unsigned int, which is why it's an unsigned int instead of just a regular int. Just to make it all type happy. So let's start. The first thing we're going to do in here is create an int pause equals text.find ch. So what that does is it looks in our string and finds the first instance of this character. And I'm going to make another variable called initial pause and set it equal to zero. And then I'm going to just clear out our strs vector in case there was something in it before we start. Okay? So pause currently has the first instance of this character we pass in. Think in terms of like a, a list. So say I had a list, say I had a string that was a list of integers like 25, 46, 3, 64. If I was to if I was to pass in a character, um, comma character, and say split it, then it would look for every comma. This function will look for every comma, split up these numbers into separate strings, and then store them in this vector. So that's the whole point of this split function. Anyway, now we're going to loop through the string. So I'm going to say while pause does not equal std string n pause. So what this means is whenever there's a whenever so, uh, we call the find function here, the string dot find function, it returns a position. If it can no longer find that um, whatever it's trying to find, so this character then it will set whatever set this pause equal to the value of n pause which is just some crazy large number so that's just how we know that it can no longer find any more instances so we're done so while pause is not this n pause that means that we found our character so what i'm going to do is i'm going to say our vector strs dot pushback txd dot substring so the substring of our our string starting at initial pause so right now the very first time around initial pause is zero so it'll start at the beginning of the string going up until pause minus initial pause plus one okay and that's how we know how far into the string to go from wherever initial pause was. Then we have to change initial pause to pause plus one because we found one. So now we have to make our next time's starting point where we found it plus one. And then finally, pause equals txt dot find our character, but instead of starting at the beginning to find it, we're going to start at an initial pause. So that's pretty simple. It'll go through, find all of them, and store them. Then we need to add the last one. So strs.pushback our substring initial pause. So wherever the last one is, store that. Then we need the standard min. Um, I'm putting the int in there to say that everything, the two things that we're finding the minimum of are ints. Because uh, the standard min is very strict about its types. They really have to be the same or it will throw you errors. So that's just a way of saying no matter what, make them int if possible. Pause or size minus initial pause plus one. And that just gets the right um, position to go up until when taking our substring. So that'll get the last one and add it in to the, um, the string.
uh, the vector. And then simply return the size of the array, just so we have it. It's good to have. And that's it. That's our string split function. We're going to use this when we're parsing the TMX file. Okay, so what's next? Let me close out of some things you don't need. Episode 11. All right. Create the slope class. Let's create the slope class. So go to header, new file, slope.h. If and if in def slope h define slope h and if we're gonna need globals and we're gonna need um eh, it's good enough for now. Alright, so class slope. So what is a slope? I already told you what a slope is. A slope is um the sloped land that we're going up. It's the hypotenuse of a triangle, that's the slope. Um, yeah, so that's what we're trying to represent here with this class. So public, private, what private variables do we have? We have two vector twos. We have a vector two p1 and a vector two p2. Every slope has two points. Those two points I'm representing with p1 and p2. So if I go back into tiles quickly, this is a point right here, and this is a point right here. Every slope has two points. And then a slope obviously has a slope that we want to just hold on to. We want that value. So um, now we're going to have our constructors. Uh, we're going to take in a vector 2 p1 and a vector 2 P2. So we're passing in our points, and we're going to set P1 equal to P1, P2 equal to P2, and in our constructor we're actually going to calculate the slope. So for those of you who don't know, let me go into paint.net, that's our nice image from our last episode. Let me make a new one. So we have this we have this slope. Okay? There are two points on the slope. There's x1, y1. And there's x2, y2. Two points. 2x is 2y. To calculate the slope of a line if you have these points, you do m, which is slope, equals y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. And that'll give you the slope of this line. So, say for example, this was, I don't know. 2 comma 4 and this point up here was 4 comma 6 to calculate the slope you would do y2 which is 6 minus y1 which is 4 divided by x2, which is 4, minus 2, which actually ends up being 2 divided by 2, which is 1. So the slope of this line would be 1. And that's what we need to know. We need to know the slope. So that later on, we could plug in the slope to calculate these. So we'll, we'll end up having the slope, because we'll have these two points, and then the player will be somewhere on this line, so it'll be a whole new point. So we'll need to calculate where to actually place the player. But I'll go into that later. But this is how we calculate the slope. Study that if you don't understand it. Uh, there's plenty of online resources explaining the slope, but I think this example kind of makes sense. So anyway, back to the program. We need to do that 
right here. So, important to note though, obviously you know we can never divide by zero. You could just never divide by zero. There's no such thing. So you'll get a runtime error if you try to. An exception will be thrown. Meaning that if either x2 or x1, well, if x2 minus x1 equals 0, that's bad. The only time that happens is when x and x2 and x1 are the same x, meaning that x1 is here, x2 would have to be somewhere here or above it meaning that the slope of this line is undefined because it's a straight vertical line. Also, please notice how I just drew a perfectly straight line with the pencil. It's pretty impressive. Anyway, <laughs> so we have to check for that, otherwise we'll get an exception thrown when we run the program. So if p2.x minus p1.x does not equal 0, then we can calculate the slope. So I'll say slope equals. Also, we need to take the absolute value of um, x2 and, well, y2, y1, x2, and x1. Otherwise, we'll get some funky errors. So I'm going to say fabs. That's the absolute value of p2 dot y minus the absolute value of p1 dot y. So this is the exact same equation I just showed you, I just drew for you, divided by the absolute value of p2 dot x minus the absolute value of p1 dot x. And that is the equation for calculating the slope. So now slope will get stored in here every time we create a new slope. And that's perfect. We're also, we're just going to implement the entire slope class right now. We're going to make a const inline float get slope. And it just returns the slope. And then we're going to have a const bool collides with because collisions are different for um, whoops, collisions are different for slopes than they are for regular rectangles. So we're, the rectangle we're passing in is the player or a monster that's running on a slope or something like that. So it's just a regular rectangle. So we need to think about what it means to collide with this slope as a rectangle. There are actually four cases we need to worry about. And since each case has four different calculations, there's 16 different calculations we need to, or 16 um, if statements basically, 16 conditions that need to pass in order to, for us to be colliding. So the, the reason there's four is because, for one, uh, it matters which side of the slope we're on. If, if the slope is going up from left to right, it's different than if it's going up from right to left, like this one. It's also, the, and so that's two different cases, but then each one of those have two cases, because if this was our P1 and this is our P2, it's going to be different than if this was our P1 and this was our P2. So before when we were making these, I said it didn't matter which one. The only reason it doesn't matter which way we draw them from is because we're about to write code that checks all of that. So basically, I'll write out the first one. We want to return, and then we're going to have a very big uh, bunch of conditions. If other dot get right so the right side of the rectangle is greater than or equal to the slopes p2 dot x and other dot get left 
is less than or equal to p1's x and other dot get top is less than or equal to p2's y and other dot get bottom is greater than or equal to p1's y. So let me just close that. We're not done yet with this, but let me just explain this. So if the right side of the rectangle is greater than or equal to p2's x. So basically, we're checking if it does collide. So let's look at tiled. The case we're worrying about now is if this right here is p1 and this is p2 on a on this kind of slope. So this is p1, this is p2. So if my rectangle's right side is to the right of this, then I'm probably colliding. But let's check more. We also have to check if my left side is less than p1's x. And yes, my left if I'm colliding with this, my left side would be less than this point right here. So still good. My top side needs to be less than p2's y. So this is p2. My top is less than this because it goes down as you go up the y coordinates. So yes. And finally, my bottom has to be greater than p1's y. This is p1. My bottom would be in here somewhere. So yes. So if all four of those things are true, then I am definitely colliding with this slope. So good. But now we have three other cases to worry about. We have to worry about when p1 and p2 here are switched, because then there are different calculations. And let's worry about these two. So let's first worry about when p2 and p1 are switched here. So I'm going to go ahead and say or other.getWrite is greater than or equal to p1's x and other.getLeft is less than or equal to p2's x and other.getTop is less than or equal to p1's y and other.getBottom is greater than or equal to p2's y. Again, it's the same stuff, except this is for when p1 and p2 are switched from the top cases. So you can go through it just like I went through it for the other one. Go through it with this one. Make sure you understand why all of this is true if we're colliding. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go on to the left side. So when I say left side, I mean this kind of slope from the bottom being on the right, the top being on the left. So that means you're going up to the left and down to the right for this next one. So that has its own set of cases for the same reason. Um, so let's just put those in. So another or other dot get left is less than or equal to p1's x and other dot get right is greater than or equal to p2's x and other dot get top is less than or equal to p1's y and other dot get bottom is greater than or equal to p2's y. And then one more for the other, uh, if the p1 and p2 are swapped on that one. Other dot get left is less than or equal to p2x and other dot get right is greater than or equal to p1x and other dot get top is less than or equal to p2y and other dot get bottom is greater than or equal to p1 
P1Y. Close that, semicolon, done. So what this does is this checks every possible case to see if we're colliding with a rectangle. And if any of these are true, any of these sets of four are true, that means we're colliding with a slope somewhere. And that's all we need to know. So that's our collides with function. Take a while to stare at each of these and understand why they work. Um, I'm also going to make two quick little getter functions for p1 and p2. Const inline vector to get p1. Const return p1. Const inline vector to get p2. Const return p2. And that's our um, slope class. So now we need to use this. So now things get a little interesting. So we have to create our list of slopes in the level class. So go to level.h. And down here underneath um, collision rects, we're going to create our list of slopes. So. Vector slope check slope. Whoa, no, 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 no. Whoops. Vector slope slopes. So that's our list of slopes. And then also go up and underneath check tile collisions, we're going to make a function that returns a vector of slopes called check slope collision. Passing in again something is rectangle. Good. So next thing on our list is parse them out of the TMX file. Yay. So go to level.cpp and we're going to um, let's open that up. We're going to parse some more stuff out of here. Another object layer. So underneath collisions and above spawn points. Really you could put this right after this comment we have here. Just another else if. So else if ss.str equals slopes. Now before we implement this let's look. Let's see what our um, TMX file actually looks like. So it would be this one. So this is all the same, blah, blah, blah. Until we get to the bottom, we have this object group called slopes. So each object group has an object. The X and the Y is the is pretty much P1. Wherever P1 is, that's our X and Y here. P, so that's the first point you drew. Then, if you remember, after you clicked, you ga they gave you a line, and you could drop the uh, you could put the next point anywhere you want, and then it would draw a line between them. So the way you get to p to the second point from the first point is if you look at this polyline object. So the first point is 184, 185. Great. This zero zero. This will always be zero zero because. To get from P1 to, well, pretty much what this 0, 0 does here is it lets us go through each of these and then just add whatever this amount is to, the, uh, to P1's spot. So for example, our first point was at 184, 185. 0, 0 means we're just going to add 0 and 0 to the X and the Y here, and that's our P1. Our second point, though, is 22 units to the right of P1 and minus 14 units means that it's going to be 14 units up from P1, okay? And that's P2. That's our second point. 
So 22 minus 14 aren't the coordinates of our second point, it's how to get to that second point from P1. So you add these numbers to this, and you get P2. <sighs> okay, that, that was very hard to explain, but um, we're going to have a, an interesting um, way of handling that in a bit. But first we need to parse it all out. So go back in here. And we're going to say XML element P object equals P object group. First child element of type object. So if P object is not null, while P object. And don't forget that we can have more than one. In fact, we will have more than one, probably, if there's more than one slope. So we have to say p object equals p object next sibling element of type object. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to deal with each individual slope. So we're going to make a vector vector twos called points. This is to hold all of the points in our slope. So if you saw, if I go back to um, tiled here, what I can actually do, and I'll do this so I could show you what I mean. Um, here for example, I can make slopes of different um, of different slopes. So for example, if I click, I could put another point like this to change how we how uh, big the slope is. So I'll just do that just so that we can see it happen. If we go back to our file here, oh, I should probably save it. If we go back to our TMX file, you will see hello. Why don't I see it? Uh, that should be the right one. The reason I, that didn't work is because I had the collisions layer. Make sure when you're drawing slopes, you have the slopes layer selected. Again, I'm going to just draw different slopes here, all connected, like that. And I'll draw this up to you. So what that looks like in a TMX file is this. P1 is here, the very first point we drew. To get to P1, we don't have to go anywhere. To get to P2, we have to go to the right 14 and up 4. To get to P3, from P1, we have to do this. To get to the second point from P4, from P1, I'm sorry. From P1, we have to do this. To get to the fifth point from P1, we have to do this. And to get to the sixth point from P1, we have to do this. So since we were going to the right with all of our slopes, you can see that the x goes up every time because the x position of the point is going up. And since we're going upwards in direction, north, you can see this number gets smaller and smaller because we're going up. Okay. So let's, so each one of these is a point. This is a point, 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 and this is a point. And that's what our um, points vector is going to hold. It's going to parse all of those out. And then we're going to create P1 because P1 is easy to get. P1 is just a vector 2 taking the ceiling of P object float attribute X. The ceiling of low attribute y. It gives us x and y right there for p1 in the right here. It gives it to us. So we don't even have to figure anything out with that. So that's p1. Easy. Now p2 is not as easy. So 
first we need to parse this polyline thing. We can only have one polyline per object, so we don't do anything fancy with that. All we're going to say is XML element P polyline equals P object first child element of type polyline. If P polyline does not equal null, that means we have one. We don't have to do a while loop because there's only going to be one. So then what we need to do is we need to get the pairs. So for example, this is a pair, 0, 0, and then 22 and 14 are a pair. So we need to get those. So I'm going to create a vector of strings pairs. Then a const char star point string equals p polyline attribute points. So then uh, this point string will have this entire, all of the points, this string with all the points. So then you could probably guess what's coming up. We need to split that up using the function we wrote before in the utils. So I'm going to make a string stream ss, get point string in there. So that it's a string instead of a char star, a const char star. And now I need to go up to the top. I need to include utils.h so that we can use it. Where are we? Slopes. And now what I'm going to say is I'm going to say utils, the name of the class, uppercase u, colon colon, scoping operator split. And we can call it like that because it's a static function. Passing it ss.str, so the string. Then we want the vector that we're going to put everything in, so pairs. And finally, we're splitting it up by space. There's spaces between each pair, so we're going to split it by space. And that's it. So, some comments. Now we have each of the pairs. Now we need to loop through the list of pairs and split them into vector twos. So loop through the list of pairs and split them into vector twos. And then store them in our points vector. So we're going to loop through this list of pairs and we're going to split them into vector twos by comma, by their comma, and then store them in our points vector. So for int i equals zero, i is less than pairs.size i plus plus, and we're going to say temporary vector of type string ps, and then utils split again passing in pairs at i, so that's the pair, that's the string, one, uh, one pair, ps, and we're going to split on commas this time. So now it's going to split it by comma, and then the vector will have two items in it, the x and the y. So then we just need to store those, we have to turn into a vector 2 and store it in our points vector, so points.pushback, new vector 2, um, and our strings are strings, not integers right now, but we need them to be integers because they're an x and a y. So there's a C++11 function called STOI, string to int. So STOI, passing it the x, oops, this has to be zero, so the first thing in our ps, and then STOI PS at 1, which is our Y, into a vector 2 and then into our points as a vector 2. So now points has all of our points in our string. So now for the fun part. Outside of this if, now we need to turn them into slopes. 
So for an i equals zero, i is less than points dot size i plus equals two. The reason we're not i plus plusing and i plus equals two is because hold on, let me remember. So points is our list of points. Right. The reason is we we want to skip every other point here. We're not really skipping it because we're going to be using i minus 1 to look at the last one and i plus 1 to look at the next one. So trust me on the i uh, plus equals 2 for right now. We're going to say slopes dot push back new slope new vector 2. So a slope takes in two vector 2's. So our first vector 2, I'm going to put this on a new line. Our, new, our first vector 2, let me do this. Our first vector 2, need, obviously a vector 2 needs an x and a y, so first we have to get the x. So p1.x then we need to get from p1.x to um, hold on, just trying to re just trying to remember what's going on here. Uh, this is a very confusing equation, so just give me one second. p1.x. Yes, so P1x, and then we need to figure out which point we're on. So if it's the first point, we don't want to go anywhere because we want P1. So we want to add nothing to it. So we're going to say P1.x plus points at, if i is less than 2, use i. i will only be less than 2 for P1, the first one, where uh, the first thing is 0, 0 here. So that's the only time i will be less than 2 because we're plus equaling 2 every time. i is 0. So we want the first one in this case. <coughs> so, oh, excuse me, I have to cough. <coughs> Alright. Choking here. Anyway i is less than 2, we're going to use i because it's 0. If i is not less than 2, we're going to use i minus 1. Dot x. So if i is greater than 2, like the second time around here, i is 2. Well, greater than or equal to 2. i is 2 the second time around. So we want, but we want i to be 1. So we're taking i minus 1. So 2 minus 1 is 1. We're going to get this point in the array, and it's going to be perfect. The whole point of all this is, say we're on this one, where we want, we get the first point good, we get the second point good, now we want the third point. What's going to happen here is, to get this minus 4, i will be greater than 2, so we can take i minus 1. So at this point, i will be 4 because we'll have plus equal 2, and then plus equal 2 again, i will be 4. So it'll get uh, this one, the third one. Okay. So... And then, of course, we need to multiply all of our x and y's by global sprite scale. Moving on. We need to do the same exact thing for y. So p1.y plus points.add. If i is less than 2, use i. Otherwise, use i minus 1. Same thing as above. Dot y times global's sprite scale. So that's our first vector 2. Now our second vector 2 is a little bit different. 
our second vector 2 is for P2. So we got our P1, now we need our P2. So P1.x plus points at if i is less than 2, then we're going to use i plus 1. Otherwise, we're just going to use i. And same thing. p1.y plus points at i. If i is less than 2, use i plus 1 again. Otherwise, use just i dot y close that times globals sprite scale good and of course we need to close that now we need to close one more thing there and that's it that's how we take all of these points here figure out where they are based on this point and uh, create slopes out of them. So there's going to be more than one slope for this one because there's more than one and that's the one where we drew all these crazy slopes here. There's multiple slopes so obviously uh, our list of slopes is going to be we have to go through all of them because we have multiple points. And that's it. That's how we parse out our slopes. So if I build this it probably won't build because I'm missing some functions. Undeclared identifier slope. Yeah, I gotta include slope.h up here. Undeclared identifier fabs. We have to include cmath. Expression is not assignable. This should not be an equal sign, it should be a minus sign. And it does compile, even though I didn't implement a function, that's weird. So if I run it, just to make sure everything looks good, still looks good. Obviously here, I'm not really colliding with anything yet, because I'm not checking it. Okay, so that's that. The next thing is to handle the slope collision. So now there's a bunch of stuff we have to do. First, let's go into level.cpp. Down at the bottom, underneath check tile collisions, we're going to check slope collisions. So we already made this function in our header file, I believe. So type slope, level, check slope collisions, taking in a const rectangle other. We're going to make a temporary, just like our uh, check tile collision, same thing. Others, loop through all of them in our slope list that we just filled up. Check if the rectangle is colliding with any of them. If it is, add it to our vector of slopes we're colliding with and return that vector. Same exact function as our tile collisions, except we're checking the slopes instead. Easy peasy. Next, we have to add our player uh, colliding with slopes function. So go to player.h. And in player.h, we're going to add a couple of functions. Or just one for now. We'll add the jumping stuff later. Void handle slope collision, taking in a vector of slopes, and then we have to implement that. So go back to player.cpp. 
Now, a few things we need to change in player.cpp. First of all, go into handle. Um, no, I'll show you why we need to do that later. So forget that. We'll just make your function void player handle slope collisions, passing in a vector of slopes. Put a comment void handle slope collisions handles collisions with all slopes the player is colliding with. Okay, so we're passing in this vector of slopes that we're coll we're definitely colliding with. We don't even have to check if we're colliding. So loop through them. So there's going to be a lot of fun uh, comments in this fun function because there's a lot of math going on. So the first thing we need to do is calculate where on the slope the player's bottom center is touching. And use y equals mx plus b to figure out the y position place him at. And the very first thing we need to do is first calculate B, which is the slope intercept, using one of the points. B equals Y minus MX. So, more math. So let's talk about this. Let me erase some of this slope stuff. Ah. Uh, I'll just undo it. All right. So let's talk about what I'm doing here, math-wise. So y equals m x plus b. So first, let's talk about what all these things are. Y is the y position of the of a point. M is the slope, which we figured out before. So we already have the slope of our slopes. X is the X position of the point, and B is the slope intercept. So what does that mean? That's a good question. B, um, I believe B is the Y intercept. But either way, we need this B value to figure out uh, the x. So, I mean the y. So, first let's talk about what we're trying to accomplish here. Let's say the player runs up this slope and he's colliding right here. Okay, here's our player. Let's say this is the point that we collide at. What we want is, let me try to find, whoops, colors. Here we go. Let me draw this in a different color. We want the player to stand here on the slope, right? But really, he's down here somewhere. So we need to figure out where on the Y to position the player based on where on the slope we are. If we're up here, we want the player to be positioned right here on this point. So we need to figure that out. So we, ha we have the x. We know the x position, because it's just wherever on this axis the player is. This is the x position. What we need to figure out is the y. Where on this y axis, so it would be here, for example, for this one, to place the player. And then combining the two, so let me, this is our x, this is our y. Combining the two puts us right here, and that's where we reposition the player to. So the B is where this line hits the y-axis. So the B would end up being this point. And the calculation for B is just rearrange this uh, function, or this equation, to B equals y minus mx.
simply subtract mx from both sides, and we have b equals y equals mx. So we need to calculate that before we can do anything. And the way to calculate that is to use one of the points we know. And we ha this is the part I was actually stumped on when I was trying to figure all this out. But then I realized we have two points. We have this point, P1, and this point, P2. Pick one. All we need to do is pick one of those points, pass them into as our x and our y, our x and our y. This should be a minus, not an equals. B equals y minus mx. So pass in our x and our y from one of our points to x and y. We have our slope already, and we calculate b. And this b is the same no matter which point on the slope we choose, meaning that wherever the player is, we'll have the same b. So that's the first thing we need to do. We need to calculate that b value using one of our points. We'll just use p1 because it's easy. So I'll say int b equals others dot at i get p1 dot y so what we're doing here is whoops we're doing our y minus mx so y is this minus and let's do m times x so others at i dot get slope that's our m times the absolute value of others at i get p1 x. That cal calculates our b and we can use that with our point down below to calculate our new y position for the player. So now we have b. Now we need to get the player's bottom, well, center x. This is the center of the player on the x-axis. Int uh, center x equals our player's bounding box dot get center x, which is the function we wrote a long time ago when we made our rectangle class. Now pass that x into the equation y equals mx plus b using our newly found b and x to get the new y position. Okay, so again, this position right here will now be our x. We're trying to figure this y position out. We have b already, which we figured out before, and we have our slope. So we're only missing one variable, our y. So we have m, x, and b. We multiply m times our, we multiply our slope times our x, add on the b we just found, and we get the new y position that we have to put the player at, which is this right here. We put the player there, and then no matter where we are on the slope, the player will be repositioned to the right spot, and it will look like we're running up the slope. That's the plan. So I'm going to call it new y equals others at i get slope times center x plus b. So y equals m x plus b. And I'm going to put this little minus 8 in here. 8 is a is temporary and it's to fix a problem. It's a little bit of a magic number here. Without it, um, our slopes get a little weird. It's because of the way we're rounding. And it might be because of something else, but I couldn't figure out why, and I didn't want to spend too much time on it. Minus 8 just makes everything remove very smoothly. You'll see what I mean. So just stick it in there. Uh, and then reposition the player to the correct Y. So if I'm on the ground, because that's the only time we're colliding with these slopes is if I'm on the ground. Don't want to collide with them if I'm trying to jump or anything.
y equals bounding box get height. Wow. We obviously have to use our new y minus our height to put us on the right part of the slope. Set grounded equal to true because we're on the ground. And that's it. That's how we handle our slope collision. So now all that's left is to call this from our games update. So go down to update in our game.cpp. And just like we did with just like we did with our tiles, we're gonna say vector of slopes other slope. If other slopes equals level dot check slope collisions player dot get bounding box dot size is greater than zero. Same thing as above, except now we're checking slopes. Player dot handle slope collisions, passing in other slopes. Okay, build that, make sure everything builds, and it doesn't uh, undeclare identifier slope in player so go to player.h and include slopes.h slopes or slope slope.h build and it works run it and we end up on the bottom for some reason okay so there's some weird stuff going on but if you look we, when we run on this slope here that we drew, he goes up the slope. We collide with that line, and um, it repositions our y position to wherever on that triangle, on that slope part, we're supposed to be. Same on this side. Now, we run into some weird things. The first weird thing we're going to fix, and it'll actually fix this one too, I think, is if we run up the slope, it ignores our y collision. Our top collision up there, we're running into that block even though there's a rectangle around it. So we have to stop that from happening. So go into player.cpp, find your handle tile collisions function that we wrote in our last episode. And we have to change something. So go to, uh, when we collide on the top, this case for top, and the first thing we're going to do, we're going to move our dy equals 0 to the top, because then we're going to say if grounded. Now that sounds weird, but the reason we're doing that is because we're standing on that, uh, on that slope. The only time we're going to hit a top tile um, is if we're on a slope. And we're, we know we're grounded if we're on a slope because we said that before. So if we're grounded, we have to do something special. If we're not grounded, just set dy to z zero so that we hit it and we fall down, that's fine. But if we're on a slope, then y equals uh, the bottom, of course. And Wait a second, no, 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 no. This y equals the bottom, we still have to do that as well so that we get out of the block we collided with on the top. So no matter what, we're going to set dy to 0 and y equal to the other one's bottom, plus 1. However, if we're on a slope and we're grounded, we're going to set dx equal to 0. That's going to stop our movement on the x-axis. And we have to reposition ourselves one, uh, a little bit outside of the block we just collided with. So x minus equals, if we're facing the right, we're going to subtract 0.5 from our x position. Otherwise, if we're facing the left, subtract minus 0.5, which adds 0.5. That'll reposition us on the x-axis outside of the block we're colliding with so that we're no longer colliding with it. 0.5 is a very small number, so it won't look too jittery. And this should fix that. So if you look, 
All right, this is our weird slope from before. It's a little buggy, but oh, I want to be down there. All right, so there are a few little bugs here. Uh, nothing, nothing too bad. Let me get rid of that slope. So as you can see, yeah, it's buggy because of the way we made it, but it works. We combine we combined all of those different sloped, um, differently sloped lines, and it worked. It got all of them the way we parsed it. So let me go back into tiles and get rid of that ugly slope. Select it, delete it. No, I just deleted all my slopes. Undo. I only want this one. Only want this one. Delete. All right, save that. Tiled undo is very good. It undoes everything. So now if I fall down here, now when I run into that, you can see that if I run, <laughs> it's a little bit buggy. If I run too, too long, it'll still go up, but it tries to stop it. Let me, uh, let me, Hmm. Let me try something. Let me see if calling uh, stop moving. We'll change anything. Because if I don't let him move, nah, he still gets up there. Let me change this to 1. 1. 0. Maybe I'm not positioning him um, far enough away, so he's still kind of stuck in there. There we go, that's better. Make it one. So now it's a little bit jittery when he collides with it, but this won't really be happening too often, if ever, other than in this map. So don't worry about it too much. But here you can see now, when he hits the top, he doesn't go into it anymore. You can play around with that a little bit more. But the slope works. Well, there, he got into it somehow. But yeah, play around with that, change the values. We'll never really see that case outside of down there, so don't worry too much about it. Okay, so what's what's left? Jumping. Let's do jumping. Jumping's pretty easy. Uh, at the top of player.cpp, since we're in here, add a new const float jump speed equals, I believe it was 0.7f. So do that, then go into player.h, make a new function underneath stop moving, I guess, called void jump. Put a comment, void jump starts jumping. Then go into player.cpp, here. Go down underneath stop moving void player jump and what do we want to happen when we jump um, a few things we have to check if we're grounded first we don't want to be able to jump if we're in the air in case story there's no double jump or anything like that I mean there's jetpacks later on but whatever we don't want to be able to jump if we're in the air so if we're grounded then we'll jump reset dy to start it out fresh then set dy minus equals our player constant jump speed and then we're no longer grounded so set grounded equal to false 
And that's it. And then all we have to do is go to game.cpp and call that. And this is good. Now that we have our jumping, we'll be able to test top collisions better uh, when we jump into a ceiling or something, because that is important. That kind of thing we'll see all the time. So now go to underneath um, underneath here is good. Now in case story, I believe the button to jump is Z. So if input dot was key pressed SDL scan code Z is true. Just call our jump function. That's it. Build that, run it. It all builds, it runs, hit Z, and there we go. We can jump. He's jumping into the ceiling. We put our rectangles there. So our slope, we hit the ceiling, it's all good. We can jump all through the map, collide with everything perfectly, nothing, no falling through anywhere. Everything works very nicely based on where we put our collision rectangles and our slopes. There's a little slope there. It's all good. And that's it, guys. That is our slopes. We made slopes. In the future, we might make a little improvements to them because they are still they could still be a little bit buggy. Occasionally I can get him to go in there somehow. Uh, jumping on the slopes. Jumping on the slope wor slopes works. Um, but it could be a little bit buggy depending on where our collision is. But yeah, see here we're jumping on the slopes. Perfect. Alright, so it works. So we're going to take a little bit break from physics and we're going to move on to some more interesting things. Let's talk about uh, what that is. This was a very math heavy and physics heavy episode, so I apologize for that. Thanks for sticking around if you have. Uh, next time we're going to have fun. We're going to have a lot of fun. Animated tiled objects. We're going to make the little health chest and the save floppy disk show up and be animated and stuff. Now, if you're familiar with the first map of Cave Story, let me uh, make it so we can't see these things. I'm just turning off uh, collision viewing those lines because we're done with that. Right here, I believe, is the health thing, and right here is a save block in uh, the first map of uh, save disk in this first map of Cave Story. So, cool thing about Tiled is that we can actually make it animate right here within Tiled. And we could, uh, it'll all be stored in the XML and we could parse that out, figure out when a tile is animated from the XML itself and just animate it in our code and then run the code and it will be just twirling around or doing whatever the animation is. So that's what we're going to focus on next time, getting this, uh, first map finished. So once that's done, this first map is done. Uh, we'll focus on then on uh, looking up and down in future episodes, going through this door, etc. But for next time, we're going to make this health chest and the floppy disk all nice and animated, and it's going to be fun. So again, I'm Limeotes. My website is limeotes.com. My Twitter is at Limeotes. Ask me any questions. Get my attention by tweeting at me. I always answer those quickly. This is my GitHub link where all of this code can be found, including the map with all the collisions in it and everything. This very one that I drew. So all these collisions exactly like I have them will be there. Uh, and this is my subreddit. It's a good place to start discussions and ask questions. Sometimes I can't answer questions, but other people will be able to. So asking them there is a really good idea because discussions start. And of course, please subscribe to this channel if you want to see more of this. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.